Absolutely. Hello, happy Friday, and welcome to another episode of Shit I Wish Someone Would Have Told Me, a series of conversations with my guest and I where we talk about all of the shit that we wish someone <laughs> would have told us at one point or another in life about various topics, all of which relate back to the most important topic, the topic of you. Today, we have a very special episode for a couple of reasons. Number one, we were going to attend live coaching, and number two, because we had some major technical technical difficulties and we just looked at the clock and realized we've been trying to solve them for a solid 30 minutes but we are here this is going to get posted we are going to get the message out and that is what it is all about we do wish that you would be live with us and so hopefully that will be happening next friday at another conversation um but for today we are on zoom and so this will be a pre-recorded edition and you know hopefully some people will be hopping on we may or may not be doing the live coaching since that was like a switcheroo at the last minute, but we'll just see how it goes and we'll talk about and share all the things that we think that you need to know. So with that being said, our topic today is moving your way into self-trust, not just, you know, the, um, and Shannon's going to talk about this in just a moment, but not just the, the mental, but also the physical, physically, how moving helps you to have more self-trust within yourself. And this is a cool concept that is very near and dear to both mine and Shannon's hearts. And so we're excited to talk about it. Um, to give you an idea of who Shannon is, um, Shannon Dyerly is a mother of four teenagers, ladies and gentlemen, four teenagers. So that means I didn't register this the other three times that we tried to record this, but that means that they were all babies at one time. They were all yes. brothers at the same time. They were all preteens at the same time. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And most people are trying to do the math on that. I'll just tell you it's because I had a daughter and then two and a half years later, I had triplets. And so that's why I have four teenagers. Yeah. I was about yeah. to say, I was like, I, I didn't put that together, but that's a lot of stuff. Like, at that, one... yeah. 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 Wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah. All the power to you and all of the moms and dads. Um, but that, that, that is impressive. So thank you. Yeah. Takes a village. Uh, yeah. And she is very <laughs> proud of that as she should be. Um, Shannon also holds her master's degree in counseling and is a fellow journey catalyst coach. That's actually how we know each other. I had said last time there'll be a quiz later. So make sure you remember that fun fact for later. Just <laughs> Her positive sphere and deep empathy are core to her approach in life. She focuses her work on developing self-love and acceptance, breaking free from codependency and perfectionism, and is passionate about sharing her experiences and knowledge to help others live the life that they are being called to. And so we're going to be talking about some of those experiences today, which I'm super excited about. She can be found online at powerplacepurpose.com and on Instagram by the same name, except with a period in between each word. So power, period, place, period of purpose. Did I get anything out? Did you want to add anything? No, you did it all. Thank that was you. a mouthful. Cool. Thank you. I You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah, of course. Thank you for doing all of this you did. <laughs> all done, doing all of the above. For Tell those, us about you, Jonna. I was going to say, yeah, thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jonna. I'm also a certified Journey Catalyst coach. I'm currently getting my hours for international coaching Federation accreditation. I help women and men who have low self-confidence and self-worth figure out who they are so they can finally feel self-assured in who that is and how they show up in this world. My primary focus is on men and women who have experienced body dysmorphia and that is because it is something that I have struggled with more myself for many years and so it is a relationship that I know very intimately like we real tight. I've been a functional fitness coach for the last eight years going on nine. I've coached well over 10,000 classes, well over a thousand individuals in both group and one-on-one -on -one settings. And I'm grateful to have transitioned into this work where I get to have conversations like this today that not only you know, talk about the physical, but also incorporate how that plays into the bigger picture of like the mental and how it just all works like beautifully together. So. With that being oh, said, what is some shit that you wish someone had told you about moving your way into self-trust? Well, um, I would I would start by saying um, it has to do with my understanding of just movement in general. Um, I started to say uh, last three times we started we tried to talk. 
I never really got messages around uh, my body other than um, to just uh, not even to take care of it the right way to just like not really pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just not important um, unless you uh, were doing something wrong with it. You got those messages. Um, so, but I grew up playing sports. I, I was always athletic. I was always doing stuff. Um, and so I think over time I learned moving my body was either for something like a greater purpose, like winning a game or playing a sport or helping someone else. Right. Or, um, keeping other people happy, not creating a problem with my body, but just sort of letting it be uh, a non-issue for people. Right. So you can imagine those messages together created a sense in me of like, well, I just, I sh- just really shouldn't pay attention to it or I should just keep it on the down low. Um, and obviously uh, over, over my adulthood, like we were just talking about having four kids, my body really did a whole hell of a lot for me to carry my children and then to uh, keep me healthy and keep them healthy uh, after that. So my relationship with moving changed after that and respecting myself and my body after that. So I really wish someone would have told me like your body counts. You can pay attention to it. You can listen to it and you can move it for you. Yeah. It's not for anyone else. It's for you. Yeah. I think that, that I don't think like that is like so beautifully put because that's not what my answer would have been. And I think that, that you pointed out something that a lot of us, it's one of those things where we aren't necessarily ever told, like some of us are, but some of us aren't, but it's more of like an underlying tone that, yeah, like your body is here for like someone else to approve of, whether that be like, you know, looking at it as like some kind of ornament, the term trophy wife, if you want to bring that in to the picture today, like there are all these different reasons that, and to your point, like about, you know, it was to win a game. It's like, we, we honor our bodies when we are in a space where we're wanting to perform, whether that be with like an aesthetic, Hey, like, look at me, I'm pretty like trophy wife, or whether that be like, yeah, like, let me like win this competition. But we rarely take the time to, like you said, like consider, Oh, this is my body. Like, let me do this because it matters. I know that there are some that all the philosophy of your body as a temple, Mm -hmm. And so looking at it in that regard, um, but I don't think that that is as popular of a phrase um, and as popular of um, a notion as those other things that we mentioned and that you pointed out. And so, yeah, Mm -hmm. that is like beautifully said um, and something that I think is very important for me. What I wish someone would have told me about moving my way into self-trust is that whenever you move, you like things literally happen like in your brain. And so we're going to dive into that later, Um, Mm -hmm. not to like spill the beans, but spoiler alert, that's where we're (laughs) going with this because um, yeah, like there's a science behind this and like, there's a reason that people are all like runners high and, you know, we talk about like the endorphins and stuff like that. And so with that being said, um, and for anyone who is listening, you know, I'm going to be asking a couple questions throughout this for you to consider yourself, like as a listener and as a person. and Shannon and I are going to answer along with you and you can always slide them into our DMs and let us know like what your opinions and thoughts are on these. But first question, what is your favorite way to move? Because we both yeah. have different perspectives on this. And so I think pretty, so. Yeah. yeah. Pretty drastic. So yeah, go ahead. You go first. What is your favorite way to move? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to throw you for a little curveball. I was thinking about this. So when we talked about this originally, um, and I still stand by this one of my most favorite ways to move is through my yoga practice. Um, I have found that having physical movement along with sort of a meditative experience um, where I have to really focus on my breath and my, um, my stillness within my movement has been a really beautiful experience of learning to trust my body and try with my body. Um, But I will tell you, when I was thinking about that, I thought about one of the things I love about yoga is that there are times when you just have to play. You have to play with a pose or you have to play with a choice, right? You have to kind of push beyond what you know to get to the next step. And so then I was like, actually, one of the other ways I really like to 
to move my body is when I'm playing. Mm. And I don't just mean like, you know, playing a tennis game. I just, I mean like literally running around the house and chasing somebody or um, doing like a, like do, dancing really crazy just to, cause just to play. Yeah. So those two things are kind of my, um, they're kind of opposite when you think of them as sort of like a, a big energy versus a, a not big energy, but they're actually, they, they actually go together for me. Cool. Thank what, you. What about you? I, well, yeah. first of all, I want to say you were like, I'm going to throw you for a loop. I'm like, we spent 30 minutes going through loops. <laughs> like, you, don't do that. <laughs> throwing all the curveballs you want. We, we have got it today. Today is the day. Wait, let me maybe take that back. I don't want, like, no, today is no. not the day. Um, no. We've had enough. So, to your point, I'm going to give a different perspective in terms of how you said that you like doing yoga because there's the movement, but also the meditation. It took me because so, okay, cliff notes. I never played sports. Some people listening might know that, but I never played sports. Um, just was never into it. My parents didn't play sports. Like it was never my only child, like never played sports. And whenever I started getting into fitness, it was for an aesthetic because I thought like, oh, you know, a female, like a woman should look like this. Mm -hmm. And so I started chasing that ideal. And anyone that knows like much about my story knows that for sure. And it got to a point where, yeah, I was doing things out of like a chore instead of a choice. And mm -hmm. when I found functional fitness, so CrossFit, um, mm -hmm. that was when I was like, okay, because my hand-eye coordination not developed, but I can pick something up and I can put it down. I can like push it like, you know, to above my head. And so these like functional movements actually translated to life and like literally like they help you live better because you, the movements that you learn in functional fitness are just that functional. And I remember where I was when I recognized like, oh crap, I've been picking stuff off the ground, picking stuff up off of the ground, like wrong all my life. I need to like pull my shoulder blades together. I need to bend my knees. I need to make sure my low back is protected, engage my core. I remember where I was. I remember I was walking on the sidewalk. Um, and so, yeah, I went to pick something up and I had that moment, which is cool. And so mm -hmm. all that is to say that in terms of moving with a purpose and moving with an intention, it wasn't until years later when I was working out in um, one of the coaches that inspired me to be a coach's class and people kept asking me questions because I was a coach at this time. And I was like, go ask him. Like, <laughs> I was like getting really irritated. And so in my head, I'm like, Jonna, like, what is wrong with you? Like, it's cool that they are trusting you to come to you. And so then I had this aha moment where I was like, oh, this is like a meditation to me. Mm -hmm. I'm very in the zone. I'm very mm -hmm. much like you said, like I'm moving with intention. I am focusing on my breath, like, because you do mm -hmm. that and you're like breathing out, like, you know, bracing your core when you're doing like, you know, certain movements. And so it was very much something that had and is still a meditative like process for me. And I do consider it like a movie meditation because like I've said before, I'll say it again, movement is the quickest way to show your brain and your body that you're in charge it's more difficult to think your way into a state than it is to move your way and act your way into a state. And so mm -hmm. you can't think your way into action. You're way more likely to action your way into a way of thinking, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah, yeah. So you can't always necessarily, and there's research behind this, um, if you look up power positions, like you can't always like, you know, law of attraction, like manifestation, that's a thing. And at the same time, it requires action and you can't just like sit around and, you know, hope for like sunflowers and butterflies if you don't like plant the seeds and like plant the flowers to like bring them to you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it's a matter of you can take the action without believing that it's true, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, that's why I think this is an important uh, thing to talk about, Jana, because I was thinking about it. I'm like, why is this important? Like, why do we want to talk about this? And I think it's because a lot of us think we have to have it all figured out up here before we can like actually lock in the lesson and feel better. Right. Right. And there's a whole bunch of different entry points on that circle that, that people need to know about. Um, and movement is one of them. Um, um, we, we can act our way into a better psychological state. 
a more yeah. elevated, open, ready to learn, and therefore more willing to change uh, place. And th that can build many, many uh, pieces of the puzzle that you're trying to, to put into place in your life. Yeah, yeah, because, and so here yeah. is like kind of what happens in that sense. Like you can't always, like we said, like think your way into something. But if you get your ass up and you move, then you're proving to yourself that this is different. You're proving to yourself, oh, I am taking action. So even if you have to like change some things up, you are going to be that much more inspired and empowered to make those changes because you've already done some stuff to get where you are. And so it's no longer like you're sitting on the couch thinking about running a marathon, let's say. It's that okay, you started walking a mile a day. And so like, now what? Like it ignites that power of curiosity and like, what else is possible? Like you have the confidence because you're like, well, I'm not sitting on the couch anymore, but I'm not there. Like you have the awareness, like you're not in the marathon yet, but you've taken the first step. And oftentimes that action, kind of like the flywheel effect, right? Like that one action is going to lead to more action. And mm -hmm. whenever you have the confidence that like, oh, well, I got off the couch. Okay, well, now I've got the confidence to walk a mile. Okay, I walked a mile. Now I've got the confidence to walk for two. And it builds. And so this is something that, yeah, like you can think about it all day, sure. But until you actually start moving and doing the work, I like to call it like putting the reps in. Mm -hmm. Until you start to do that, then it's really hard for you to actually believe that it is possible until you start like making that movement. And that leads into self-trust because- Whenever you start to take the action, you start to trust yourself. Otherwise, it's yeah. kind of like you're lying to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're telling yourself you're going to do something, but like you're still sitting on the couch, then your subconscious is like, bitch, you, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're lying yeah. to yourself. Yeah. So, and you know that feeling, you know that <laughs> feeling inside. And I think the thing that's interesting about um, all of this, and we'll get into this in more detail is literally putting your body in a different physical state does create all these different uh, hormonal and physiological changes inside, which impacts your brain, right? Mm -hmm. And when your brain is impacted in a positive way, then it locks in the lessons that you're sharing with it in those moments, right? It's not just the endorphins and the runner's high, it's the learning centers are open now. Yeah. And so when you take that walk, you get off the couch, you're teaching your brain that your body can do this thing, yep. right? And then every time after that, that you want to do that, you have not just the confidence that comes from, I did it before, you actually have it mapped in your brain. There's a reference point now. I can actually do the thing. And so there's far less resistance. Yes. Yes. And that's really important because we all have resistance points built in, right? From what we've done and what we've learned before. And, and, and so being aware that it's not just like, you know, oh, I can check this off on my tally, right? My training is done for the day. Right. It's, it's a far more mind body connection mm -hmm. in those moments too. Yes. And thank you for putting it into that context to talk about your resistance points. Like you know, those resistance points can come from things that we've seen other people do, things that we haven't seen other people be able to do, um, things that are like deep beliefs that we have about ourselves and our abilities based on like what someone told us, what, you know, we did or again, didn't see others do. And they can come from so many different angles. So this is like a really, it's a simple concept, but a really complex topic at the same time. And yeah to add to that layer about like these new pathways being built in your brain, it's building that self-trust because once you have that evidence, like you said, that like connects like, oh, right, we did, you know, check off the training. Yes. But like you're proving to yourself that you can do the thing. And so next time you're sitting there on the couch, it's going to be less of a bitch. No, but more of a like, yeah, we did do it that one time. Like, all right, like, let's go. And like, yeah. you're, you're working on like building and creating like the new habit. And so and can I add to that too? One of the other things that doing that gives you is the feeling of a, of a accomplishment, mm -hmm. right? And when you feel accomplishment, you're hitting that reward center in your brain, right? And if we are rewarded for something we've done, we are far more likely to do it again. 
Yes. It's it's exactly why Instagram and social media and all that stuff works because we're like, boop, boop. Oh, that feels good. Oh, you know, yep. so yep. so that's part of the cycle too. And that is yep. also brain science. Like that is in our system. Yes. Yeah. And I love that you brought up, I and mean, that's a whole ass another topic on that's why we like, <laughs> check our phone for like, oh, did they did they text me back? Did they text me back? Because that's that like shot right. of like, oh, love and connection, like love and belonging, like. Yeah. Message me, even though it's like, oh God, like it's so overwhelming. We still look for it. Yeah. Like, I I challenge anyone to just go the next hour without checking your phone. Just go the next hour. I bet right now there's a lot of resistance popping up around. Oh, but like, what if I miss a notification? But like, what if someone calls me? What if someone needs yeah. me? Um, Especially if you're responsible for something, which almost all of us are right maybe my maybe your kids at you know daycare maybe there's a big work call or a project that you don't know what's going to happen maybe you're worried that someone's out driving and they might need like like I am with my all my teenagers out on the road like yeah you you're it's right there so you get that affirmation you get that uh you know that confirmation and you get that reward and yeah. then that reinforces the behavior over and over and over yeah again. so that that's why we are addicted to the phones and social media and so okay so even if you don't like not check your phone like allow yourself to receive notifications if they come in but like you know just be mindful of how many times like you're picking up the phone so yeah if you're mm -hmm. responsible for something try to like not pick up the phone unprompted for like an hour see how that goes yeah curious see how I, that feels i actually turned off all my notifications like i don't have kids like i <laughs> turned off all my <laughs> notifications my phone makes no noises and so when it does sometimes like I accidentally get the button turned on and i hear it and i'm like what, what was that I'm like <laughs> did someone <laughs> did. Yeah, yeah like did someone put their phone in my bag like what just happened <laughs> so it, it's been like a really cool thing like I have certain times when I check like and it just mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah well the other thing that that does and I think this also goes back to our topic of self-trust is it, it's creating a new habit for you right mm -hmm. and there's a new reward and there's a new feeling in your body that comes from that behavior which makes you want to keep doing it and yeah. so you know I'm guessing and tell me if I'm wrong you're saying not having that going off there every five seconds have allowed you to stay focused on the things that you really want to stay focused on. Yes. And that feeling of trusting yourself to stay on task for the things you want to get done and need to get done feels really good. Yes. Yes. And so you don't need to go back and check the phone. You don't need to have the notifications on. And I, and I think that's just one small way of, you know, of illustrating what we're talking about here. Um, you know, that doesn't have to do really with movement, but has to do with the concept of these micro changes. Um, there's this book called Atomic Habits. I keep looking up because I think it's on my bookshelf. Um, love, yeah, it's Atomic there. Habits, yeah. Um, that talks about literally like changing by 1% every day uh, feels really small, right? Just a 1% change. That literally means I got off the couch uh, to go get a drink as opposed to staying on the couch, right? Mm -hmm. But after you do that for a week, you're 7% different than you were at the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. And you're teaching yourself how to do things differently. I and so the, yeah, so the smallest, the smallest of changes does lead to a different experience. Yeah. I love that you brought that up. I literally sent, I literally said that to someone earlier this week and then like sent them an article <laughs> about it. Awesome. Having Jonna as a friend is either really fun or really annoying. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I but, know. I send articles to a lot of people too. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, um, yeah, that was how I responded to whatever they were. I don't remember what the topic was we spoke about, but yeah, that is exactly right. And we can relate that 1% also to, like I was saying in terms of from like couch to marathon, like it doesn't have to be like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go run a marathon, but like, okay, maybe you make it fun. Maybe you go buy like some new workout shoes. Well, now mm -hmm. you've got the shoes. So maybe, you know, the next day you go to the park maybe you like going to the park maybe you do it again maybe like the park is like you know what your maybe the park is like your one percent for like three days and then mm -hmm. from there, like yeah like just like you said like these small moments to start to build which again like 
rewires your brain to say like, oh yeah, we can trust that thought. We can trust whenever, mm -hmm. you know, he or she tells himself like, oh, I'm going to go do that thing because like they, they did it. They did it. Yeah. There's, proof, there's evidence. And so that's yeah. a really cool notion. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and can I interrupt and say one thing too? I feel like it's important. Like I keep thinking this, so I'm going to share, yeah. um, to bring it back to the beginning of like the shit we wish someone would have told us about our body mm -hmm. um, and what it's capable of and what we can do with it. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important to bring up here um, is that sometimes our body doesn't feel safe mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes our body protects us from danger, um, but then we store that fear, right? And it, it is also proven <laughs> scientifically like, that trauma and um, all of the things that have gone with it are stored physically and neurologically. And so one of the things that's part of this discussion that we haven't said outright is restoring a sense of safety in your body. Um, and when we talk about movement, that's one of the things that actually happens is to go back to those um, changes inside and the, the neurotransmitters that come out and the runner's high and the endorphins and the rewards that's actually all like soothing your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And when your nervous system is soothed, you feel safe. Yeah. And so again, we're more open to learn and we're open to change when we have that sense of safety. So I just wanted to bring that in too, because that's, that's part of the picture. Yeah, it definitely is. And thank you for doing that. It's interesting you because I, I think you know, but I'm rereading The Body Keeps the Score. And like, it's such a good book if you've never read it. Like, Sladen and Medean, I will like, sell you on it. Like, it is so good. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. I'm rereading it. And yeah, that reminds me of like, I think I'm going to add reading some to my to do list today because I've not done that yet. But um, one of the things that we talked about last week with Adam from Fix Your Picker was the four S's of healthy attachment and exactly mm -hmm. what you said, um, being safe, secure, seen and soothed. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. going into, like you were saying, like the safety in your body, like that, that being like trust, like that you have and like the self-soothing. And so, yeah, this is just kind of one of those things where like, we talk about different topics and at the same time, it's so intertwined and connected yeah that it's this holistic thing that you really have to invest the time in to like understanding and like figuring out what parts of it you need and when mm -hmm. and knowing like what all is out there so that you can know what to apply later. And so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because um, I love that you brought that part up because I was like, oh shit, that's literally like what we were talking about. Yeah, so, yeah, I love that. I love those not, four, those four S's are awesome. Yeah, and at the same time, it's totally not what we were talking about because last time yeah. we were talking about how you were not your trauma response, which is not what we're talking about today in terms of how movement can help you literally trust yourself more. So with that being said, and this is another question for anyone that is listening to Ponder, how does it feel when you move? Like what kind of emotions do you get? Hmm. Yeah, you know, and Jana, I think for me, when I move, look at you, you're so cute. Um, I feel free. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, I do feel um, happy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can feel um, playful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you? You, so I totally, we went... <laughs> Like off course but I think it was a great off course um but it was on course in terms of yeah talking about like the the movie meditation component of it I also wanted to touch on the play part of it because mm -hmm. it never felt fun to me when I like said mm -hmm. I never played sports because I can hated them like <laughs> what's the point and like chasing a ball around like I didn't get it like that wasn't mm -hmm. fun for me and I think that um whenever that element of play came in like it was cool for me to play and see like how far I could test like my body and my limits. And one of the principles or concepts or suggestions whenever you are doing functional movement is to find a movement that you enjoy. And so I always thought that was really cool, whether that be, yeah, like swimming or yoga or like martial arts or like soccer, like whatever. And I always thought mm -hmm. that was really cool um, because play is something that we don't talk about much. And so, yeah, I love that you brought it back to that. I definitely would say that 
for me whenever I am considering how it feels when I move, it feels in control. Like I feel mm. in control of my body. And um, I had this thought, like thoughts come to me, like whenever I am working out because I just like get in the zone. It's like, I'm open to receive, like you said, like mm. I'm valuable mm-hmm. in terms of like what comes up for me. If I feel stuck on like a project or like, you know, um, something like that's going on with my client, if it's something that I'm kind of like working through, then I'll go and move. And all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, this is a suggestion for that. This is, you know, an option that I could try here. And so Mm -hmm. I feel kind of like an open channel in that sense. And also, like I said, very controlled. That's something that to take it to your point of feeling like Satan, um, secure Mm -hmm. and like soothe. I don't think that I knew was possible in feeling not that I didn't feel unsafe in my body, but it was just kind of, like you said, like it was just kind of my body. And so whenever I learned how to move and like what weights I could do, how fast I could go, I learned to trust it. And so whenever I am in a space where I am moving, I feel in control in the sense that I'm like, okay, I can push harder here. Okay. I need to like, like step off a little bit there. And that sense of, I mean, proprioception is like your body's awareness Mm. of surroundings, but (laughs) what it basically means in terms of like this conversation is just knowing like your limits, like when to test them and see what else is possible and like learning where you are at that point in time is something that, yeah, really helps me feel because as humans, we love to be in control. It really helps me feel that I'm in control of um, my body and that therefore helps me have that trust Mm -hmm. to to feel like I am in control of other situations. And if I'm not, to know what I need to do and to know that I have the ability to do the things that I need to do to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when you were talking, I just kept thinking of the word capable. Like there's this experience consistently in your movement story of when I tried and I did, I learned I was capable. And that gave me a sense of, um, my power, Mm -hmm. right. That also gave me a sense of, uh, where I could push for more Mm -hmm. and where I, where I couldn't. And in all of that, I learned um, to, to trust. I yep. learned to trust myself. Yep. And, and that obviously translates beyond being in the gym and doing your functional fitness, right? Yes. yes. And one thing to, to, to your point, I thought about this, but I didn't say it earlier. Whenever I, like I said, never knew that like, that's the way I could feel in my body. And whenever I started learning these things and like the capability of it, it reminded me of like exactly what you said, like how capable I am. And so now whenever I work out and I move, it's kind of like I'm coming back home Mm -hmm. because I found myself in movement. Mm -hmm. And whenever I feel like I said, like I'm kind of like lost, like disarray, like my head's kind of like, you know, out in space. I need to like get grounded. Mm -hmm. I move. And yeah, it's like returning home to myself. That's so beautiful. I love that. And I think it's really important for all of us to find ways to feel that yeah. inside ourselves. Yeah. Um, movement, movement can get us there, you know, to, to really like connect an experience with a felt sense of something. Right. Um, and for you, that experience of being in, um, being in your functional fitness world and, and, and feeling the difference it made in you. Mm-hmm is your home space, right? It's your landing spot. It's your, it's your safety zone. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, as a side note, I'm going to, since we're talking about safety, I'm going to, um, tell people there's this awesome, um, clinical social worker from Canada. His name is Jake Ernst, E-R-N-S-T. He's developed a model of eight routes to safety. Um, so you talk, you can, you can just Google that you guys. I'm like, look for all these different ways we can create safety in our environment that then helps us feel it internally because we're all different, right? We have all different ways to get there. Right. Movement is one of them. Somatic body stuff is definitely important in a lot of ways, but there are also maybe ways somatically to smell things, to hear things, right. To, um, wrap things around ourselves, right? Why do you think heavy blankets are so popular, right? Like we need to feel, right? So, and you and I talked about music as one of the things that we, that we use, 
um, yeah. to get a different feeling, right? Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But yeah, like, so I love that you mentioned play. Let me touch on that for just a second. I think for me, like, the functional movement is now fun for me. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like an opportunity to play because like, initially I was like, want to get the score. Like, I want to be like, you know, top of the class, like whatever. And now I'm just like, this is fun. Like yeah. sometimes, sometimes like I usually just use it for movie meditation, but yeah, sometimes like it's just for fun. Like, mm -hmm. because I like seeing the friends, the community. Um, and I like, yeah, just like moving my body. And I, one of the things that I really enjoyed during the lockdown, um, was listening to my own music during, <laughs> during mm -hmm. my workout. So yeah, I definitely want to like touch on that in terms of movement being like, um, Kelly McGonigal has done like a lot of research on like movement and like, she has some really cool stuff and she wrote a book called the joy of movement, um, which mm -hmm. I have not read, but I do enjoy her podcasts, um, that I've listened to. It's only been a couple. So don't like, you know, come at me if <laughs> you try it, you're not a fan. But one of, the, one of the things that she said on this one podcast with Rich Roll was that your music is your body's invitation to move. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool because a lot of times when I'm like, oh, what do you want to listen to? Like to the class, they're like, I don't know. Like they don't care. Yeah. I'm like, how do you not yeah. care? And so yeah, yeah that, that is true. We did talk about how music is like a key part of it. So how does music help you in terms of your movement? Uh, well, for, for me, um, it's so funny you say that because there were certain, there are certain yoga um, instructors that I like because only because I like their music, <laughs> right? And there are some where I'm like, oh, that was like a really good series of, of, of poses and, and. Oh, no, you froze. No, come back. I think for me, it's really. Um, what does it, what does it help to tune into? Oh, well, my internet connection is unstable. Forgive me if I'm going in and out. Oh, no. um, we got, um, okay, go, no, go. Okay. Sorry. So, um, I don't know how far I got there, but for me in a yoga class, if the music is opening up almost like a rhythm inside of me, then I am happy. I don't care who the music is by. Um, but I, I literally, if I can use it to connect to my movement, I feel awesome. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of class for all you people out there who, who practice yoga, when you're laying in your Shavasana and you're like, at the end, you're just soaking it in. And there's often a really peaceful kind of chanting or simple, uh, music. It, it feels like it sinks into my bones. Oh, it just kind of kind of rests into me. Mm -hmm. Oh no, technical difficulties. We've gotten to, it sinks into your bones, but you're frozen, y'all. Y'all, we're gonna start doing these in person. Okay, Wi-Fi is back. You were saying that whenever you are listening to certain music that like opens you up in a class that you feel it in your bones. And I was like, damn, what kind of a workout experience is that like? And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think like music can open different channels inside of us, right? Like that's why it is part of human history from the beginning. We, we connect to sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I do find there are certain moments where I'm laying there and the, the music is going and it's like, oh, I can just feel it in me. And that just cements and like locks in the experience I'm having or I have I've had um, from that movement so much more deeply than if I just, you know, did the movement, rolled up my mat and walked out. Right. That's a yeah. really cool thing. And I think it's one of those little like, subtleties that a lot of people don't consider because mm -hmm. I am, my music is, I would say pretty varied, whether it's like EDM, Rage Against the Machine is my favorite. And so, you know, those are pretty, you know, contrasting, like we got some like Cardi B in there, there's some Beyonce, <laughs> like, kind of all over the board, but mm -hmm. I think it depends on what type of a mood I'm in and like what I need to heal, like what I need to hear in the moment to help produce the kinds of like outcomes 
yes. that I'm looking to get out of that workout. Like if it's a workout yeah. where there's like something on my mind, like I'm feeling some type of way, like I'm upset about something rage all day. Um, mm-hmm. Whenever Bernie drops out of the election, I like went and worked out and listened to like rage against the machine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story <laughs> because I was like I don't know what to do um and so yeah but like a lot of other times like I love listening to like some Beyonce like which is not the same um mm-hmm. both I think prolific in their own right but like not the same no. so um yeah I think that that is a really cool mention to like bring to everyone's awareness and also just to point out that there's there's science to it like in that conversation I mentioned with Kelly McGonigal and uh, Rich Roll there was talk about how studies have shown that whenever you do you know hear certain sounds like it's that certain like deep bass like that beat mm-hmm. it like encourages you to want to do more like you said like you feel it right like it kind yeah. of internalize it and so therefore like your performance is different like your mood towards mm-hmm. your performance is different and so mm-hmm. there's all these little things that I think we kind of know in terms of like yeah like I like to listen to certain music or yeah like movement does make me feel better but we don't recognize that like there's literal science and mm-hmm. like changes that happen in like the physiology of your brain whenever these things are going on to prove like how you were feeling. Yes, and and because of that, we don't have to look at, you know, oh, this song just hypes me up because it's like loud and fast, right. you know, or like I need to play this to run or whatever it is. It's, you can create an experience internally based on some purposeful choices Mm -hmm. that you make and you can actually do that over and over and over again and change some things permanently for yourself yeah and I know we've mentioned it and we talked about like you know weaving in some of the science behind it but the concept of neuroplasticity is that like you can literally rewire your brain this is a proven evidence-based And it's one of those things that, again, like law of attraction, like manifestation, like it's, it's something that seems a bit wooey, you know, Mm -hmm. lack of a better word um, and like out there, but there's science behind it Mm -hmm. and like how, whenever you create these new pathways that's done by like taking action and like proving, you know, to yourself that you can do these things. And Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, I explained this to a client the other day, like if you think about like a trail in the woods, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you were walking through the woods and you see a trail versus like a bunch of fucking like branches, you're going to take the trail, right? Of course. Yeah. Your brain does. That's what you do. That is the way your brain thinks your brain looks for patterns. So you're going to take the trail. And if you want to, you know, let's say figure out like, what's up the mountain versus Mm -hmm. going down by the waterfall like you've always done then you're gonna have to make the changes and take the steps to carve out a new path to carve out a new trail so that means the first time you go down it like you might get you know scratched a couple times it might be kind of like crazy up in there but the more you start going down that path the more you will start to take that path in like instinctively and the more the other one will start to grow up and that will be the one with the branches and so like yes. you end up getting up the mountain you'll remember the waterfall and like you'll know how to get there but instinctively like you've created that new habit so now you're going to go up the mountain nine times out of ten yeah especially if there's a reward with each step you've taken there where like you clear those branches and you see a new view yeah or you get higher up and you realize holy shit i can do this or you get to the top and you say, oh my God, that's the, that's the thing. That's, that's the view. The that's the, right. Whatever it is. And so that all is that, that cycle we're talking about again. Right. And you said it so well, um, the more you do something, the more it's wired into your brain. Right. And they, they talk, we talk about this idea with neuroplasticity of like you fire the way you're wired. Right. So it's always going to go from A to B until you teach it to go to C or D or E. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's through experience. And mm-hmm. you, you can actually create that for yourself right. um, and link it to different beliefs about yourself, which then comes into our topic of self-trust, right? So like if I climbed that mountain and I got to the top, now I can believe, right, that I'm capable. Yep. And then I can trust myself when I want to try a new trail. Yep. That I'm capable. 
Yeah. I love yeah. that. That is yeah. like, drop the mic. Woo. Love it. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's yes. exactly like what is happening in your brain whenever you are, like you said, it's like a cycle. Like the more you take action to prove it, the more you're going to believe that you can. And so yes. like you keep like moving forward in that direction. And yeah, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even going to try. Like you said it, like, you know, that you're capable. <laughs> Like you can trust yourself yeah. if you are. So, yeah. all right. Well, um, I think that brings us to like a beautiful stopping point in terms okay. of awesome. what we've been talking about today. And so uh, what are your key takeaways from today? Um, gosh, well, I think one of the biggest things I, I would love for people to embrace, right? Is this idea that first of all, you're worth trusting. Mm-hmm. Okay, we didn't talk about that too much, but at the core of all of this is we're talking about this because you're an important person on this planet. You're here for a reason and you're worth trusting. The second thing I want people to, to see is that it may, it, it may take some practice, right? To learn to trust yourself. And there's all different things that we can do. And movement is one of those things. You know, you're talking about neuroplasticity and we're using this metaphor of hiking, but guess what? Going out for a hike is a great way to move yourself into a different emotional state. Mm -hmm. You can get to those places on that circle of feelings, you know, and beliefs and stories you tell yourself about what you're worth and what you can do from all different places. Yeah. Um, movement is one of them. And keep in mind that it's gonna feel a little scary sometimes, right? It might not always feel safe. Yeah. That's when you just dial in, get curious. Why don't I feel safe right now? Is it because I don't trust myself or is it because this is new? Yeah. And also I think that those, I love all those takeaways, but I think that to your, to piggyback off of your point about trusting yourself and getting curious. If you don't know what questions to ask, stress and anxiety, actually, the reason that we feel like alone in those moments, it's actually a signal to our bodies and our brains to reach out and experience community, to mm -hmm. reach out to get that like sensation of love and belonging because you need it in those moments. Like we aren't here to do this alone. I know that, you know, our society's mm -hmm. like, do it yourself and like, boss bitch or like whatever the fuck like yeah the, yeah the, and there is a certain level of you know needing to be like interdependent and having that self-trust and like who you are but that also comes from being feeling experiencing feelings of love and belonging like maslow's hierarchy yes. of needs. i talk about this yes. all the time you can't experience self-esteem and self-actualization until you feel like you belong and you were a part of something and that is community and so i think that that is a key point to point out and so yeah like get curious for sure and also know that you can and should, um, I hate to use the word should, but know that you can yeah. and know that that is an opportunity for you to reach out and ask for help, whether that be family, friend, whether that be us, whether that be yeah. someone else in your network, but that's a signal to do so. And especially yeah. if you are leaning into more trust, then reach out to those, like make a list of people that you think are trustworthy because, mm -hmm. or people that you admire, that you feel like you can trust. And that can kind of start to give you a sense of like, okay, well, like what characteristics do they have? Like, what are the things that they do? And that can help you not only see like, you know, what it is that they are presenting, but also what it is that you are recognizing as being mm -hmm. what it means to trust someone. Yes. I think yes. Aside Beautiful. from those key takeaways, um, mine would be to trust yourself to know what you do and don't like in terms of like mm. movement and in terms of anything, but particularly movement, trust yourself to try the different things. I don't care if you've never done kickboxing, if it looks cool, go fucking do it. Yeah. If you want to take a functional movement class, I am your woman, come on and see me. I am not ever going to say it is the gospel because it is not. However, it did do amazing things and change my life. And so I think that it is a gateway and I'm happy to share that with anyone and everyone that <laughs> wants to experience it. Um, and then, yeah, just knowing that whatever your current state is now, trust yourself to know that you can change it, mm -hmm. that you are capable. Yeah. And oh, even like, if it's only by 1% today, even, that's, all, that's all you have to do. Yeah. That's 365% by the end of the year. So yeah. All right. One last question for everyone. 
And that question is a big one. And that is, what does your story tell you about how worthy you are of letting yourself be physical and feel things and be taken care of and receive? So what that means, like basically, what are the beliefs that you have about yourself and the things that you tell yourself about who you are? What does that say about how you feel worthy in allowing yourself to experience new types of movement and allowing yourself to feel these things of like happiness and joy and play and to be taken care of by others, the community and to receive whatever it is that is out there, whether that be help from others, whether that be money, whether that be, you know, a smile from someone on the street. So what does your story tell you about your worth around that? Because spoiler alert, it has to do with how you trust yourself. So if you are like, oh shit, I feel you. <laughs> and <laughs> Shannon and I are here. If you are like, my story is telling me some bullshit. My story is not telling me nice things. Or if you're not even sure what your story is telling you, then this is your invitation. Shannon and I would like to invite you to book a 15 minute clarity call with either one of us. You can find that information at the link in our bios, or you can slide into our DMs and open the conversation there. But like we mentioned in the beginning, we are here to serve others and to help make this world a little bit better of a place than it was when we found it. And so any way that we can do that, we are here to, and we would love to be part of your journey. And we thank you for taking your time to be with us today and to listen to this conversation. Please do share it with someone if you thought it was valuable. And also please do slide into our DMs at power period place period purpose and at soul searching and squats on Instagram and let us know what you think. And we'll see you next time. We will. Thanks for having me, Jana. So good to be here with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.